Geopolitical events are only adding to the demands of today's CEO. Russia's invasion of Ukraine forcing some tough decisions, which are also looming over China after President Biden's commitment to defend Taiwan. Well, Ian Bremmer is the founder of Eurasia Group and the author of The Power of Crisis. He spoke with Yahoo Finance Editor-in-Chief Andy Serwer as our coverage from Davos continues. Part of the problem is that no one believes this war is going to be over anytime soon. And there is an extraordinary amount of both support and consolidation from the United States and NATO allies across Europe. $40 billion from the U.S., more than the White House asked for, with the Democrats and Republicans falling all over themselves to be in favor of that bill and to get themselves out to Kiev to show support for President Zelensky. Nobody believes that there'll be that level of support in a year's time. But what if Ukraine needs it? And then there's a question of how long will the Europeans be willing to sacrifice economically? Because they are. I mean, they're taking it more on the chin in favor of defending the rights of the Ukrainians to exist than perhaps anyone expected that they would. And it's been a great thing. And NATO is getting stronger and Finland and Sweden are going to join. Um, and they are decoupling in terms of oil and gas and the rest. But that doesn't mean that the level of Ukrainian support is going to be in a year's time what it is right now. And surely Zelensky knows that. Surely Vladimir Putin knows that. And so it seems that that's somewhat related perhaps to some other comments that came in via the internet here at Davos from Henry Kissinger, who said that, well, perhaps Ukraine should consider simply giving up some land to the Russians. What's your reaction to that? Well, he's almost 99, so he probably wants the war to be over while he's still with us. There's that. Um, but, you know, more seriously, I, I, this is about the Ukrainians, right? Uh, they have agency. And, you know, Dr. Kissinger is someone who believes that the great powers act and smaller countries don't really have agency. But the fact is that war crimes have been committed by the Russians on the ground in Ukraine. Uh, President Biden called out Putin as a war criminal. The Ukrainians are fighting. They're fighting courageously with a defense budget that is one-tenth the size of Russia. Uh, they are losing an awful lot of both civilians and fighting soldiers. Um, so many just citizens of Ukraine have taken up arms, given up their jobs, given up their families to fight on the front lines. And so I think if the Ukrainians say they're willing to fight, and if the Ukrainians say we are unwilling to negotiate for any inch of land that is ours, that is territorially ours, then I think the United States and Europe has to back that up. Now, that doesn't mean Crimea, which was an autonomous, largely Russian uh, region, even when Ukraine was independent, with a Russian base on it. And I think that a lot of Ukrainians, even though they won't say that publicly, recognize it. There's a question of, you know, do you get a frozen conflict? And how much of the Donbass are the Russians able to take? But the idea that the Ukrainians are going to sue for peace because they're smaller and the West, you know, sort of you know, puts, puts a lock hold on them, that's not going to happen. I think the Ukrainians are actually sovereign actors here. So how is this related to your new book, The Power of Crisis, that's just out right now? Well, the last 20 years, we've in the West been watching as our domestic and international institutions have eroded, bit by bit, year by year, whether you're talking about the Supreme Court or the American national election legitimacy, or whether you're talking about the United Nations Security Council and NATO. Remember, NATO itself, uh, Trump said it was obsolete, Macron said it was brain dead. No one would say that now. What's the power of crisis? The power of crisis is saying that in that environment, it turns out you don't like crises, but you take advantage of crises. That's the only way you are able to reshape, reform, or rebuild the institutional framework that hasn't been working for you. And it turns out you need a crisis that's big enough that forces you to make those decisions. You can't just be um, complacent about it. The crisis can't be so overwhelming that you refuse to move. If the Russian crisis had been perceived as larger when they invaded Georgia in 2008, Ukraine in 2014, Putin probably wouldn't have invaded on February 24th. But the February 24th intervention, invasion, war, special military operation, was absolutely large enough to force the West to come together. I would argue the climate change 
20 years ago was all about activists and saving whales and hugging trees. Not anymore. Why? Because it's not about the Maldives and Bangladesh. It's also about California and Australia and Italy. And as every young person in the world recognizes that their future is in doubt, they're taking action and corporates and banks are listening and increasingly so are governments. So climate change has become what I call a Goldilocks crisis. This book is all about an environment of geopolitical recession where our institutions increasingly aren't seen as legitimate, don't work, and yet the crises provide hope. What does this environment tell you as an investor or what should it tell investors to do right now? What do you think? Uh, it tells you that the role of the dollar as the global reserve currency remains unchallenged, that the flight to quality and to safety remains very significant. Even for the crypto bros, of whom there are legions at the World Economic Forum, turns out that no, you can't just use crypto for anything because when the Russians invade Ukraine and the US government says shut down those crypto wallets of the Russian oligarchs, that's what they do, right? Coinbase listened. They all paid attention. Well, wait a second, you know, that's, if you mean fiat is like still sovereign? Yes, it turns out it is. So that's the first point. Second point, for 50 years, the World Economic Champ Forum has championed globalization. And globalization, of course, for many of the attendees, they've championed it because they've gotten really rich, right? It's global elites, it's multinational corporations, but it's not just that. I am a fan of globalization because it helped a global middle class emerge. But the last three years have not been that. The pandemic and the Russia war are about the unwinding of a global middle class. They're the ones that have taken it on the chin. They're the ones that have been disrupted maximally. Their governments don't have the money to ensure that they can get through the pandemic intact. They're the ones that are suffering the most from the food inflation, from the commodity inflation. And now we're seeing a lot of those countries start to really fall apart. So globalization is not unwinding, but it's fragmenting. Pieces of it are decoupling and it's being driven fundamentally by this shift in how we think about the global middle class. That was Ian Bremmer, the founder of Eurasia Group and the author of The Power of Crisis with Yahoo Finance editor-in-chief Andy Serwer.